going to record this session and Gabe's. Um, so again, our expectations for the group is this is being recorded, so be mindful that this is um, going to be put up on YouTube for longevity. Um, so we ask that participants stay muted during the main presentation. Um, and then if you do unmute, be mindful of your background noise. Um, you know, uh, we know everyone's home, we're, we're with family, we're with our pets, no big deal. But if you're not talking and a siren's going off, or like me, I have an ice cream truck in my background, I will mute myself when I'm not talking. And then virtual backgrounds are perfectly fine, but please avoid any sort of moving backgrounds for our friends that might have vision-induced motion sickness. Um, we do have a few in our group that, um, that live with this. And um, just remember to be nice and be respectful. And that um, is a good segue to, to talk about our code of conduct. Um, we, as the San Francisco Drupal Users Group, seek to provide a friendly, safe space environment for everybody. So we ask that all participants, um, we want to allow all participants to be able to engage in productive dialogue. So this means we should be able to share and learn with each other in an atmosphere of mutual respect. So we require everybody to adhere to the Bad Camp Code of Conduct, which comes from directly from the DrupalCon Code of Conduct, which comes from the Drupal Code of Conduct. Um, and this applies to all community interactions um, and events um, here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And this includes Slack conversations and Zoom chat as well. Um, so today, Jeff from Tandem is going to be talking about um, Drupal contributions with um, Lando. Um, he wants to le we want to leverage the power of Lando to spin up a contribution environment. Um, we want to be able to test our contributions and make patches. And then we want to be able to tear down that instance and start all over when we create a new patch. Um, so he's going to be talking about the tooling that makes these things automatic and as painless as possible. And this is a double feature tonight. So Gabe is with us and he's going to be talking about um, LLC corporations. Um, he'll outline the differences between the various business entity forms and the pluses and minuses of each, including touching on tax considerations and administrative burden. And he's a principal um, attorney and principal at Matchstick Legal. In Drupal News, um, much like last time we met, there's one exciting piece of news I want to share that um, that the Drupal Association and Dries announced that um, Drupal 7's end of life has been extended. Um, it's been scheduled for November of 2021 because um, previously, um, but because of COVID and people's budgets and um, extenuating circumstances, they're extending that to the end of November 2022. So they're extending Drupal 7's end of life for another year. So that's fabulous for people. And Drupal events, um, I talked about Drupal Camp Asheville. They are online July 10th through 12th and they just announced their session schedule. That's up online. Um, the 10th is going to be contributions and unconference in various trainings and then the 11th will be sessions and then the 12th we're not quite sure what we're going to do yet something fun and community oriented DrupalCon Global is the week after that July 14th through 17th and they're slowly announcing the schedule so check online and they um, opened up the birds of the feather so you can go and sign up for slots for birds of the feather and there's all kinds of summits happening that week and the summits are now included in the regular programming, so you don't have to pay any extra to go to summits this year. Drupal Camp Colorado is August 14th through 16th, and I believe they're still accepting call for papers. Um, Drupal Camp Atlanta is virtual September 10th through 12th. Bad Camp, everyone's favorite Bay Area Drupal Camp, is October 14th through 17th. Um, we will be announcing what trainings will be happening next week and we're going to open up registration and the call for papers the week of DrupalCon, so watch out for that. Drupal Camp New York City, um, they're thinking they're going to be either October 30th, 31st or November 13th and 14th. Um, 
whether or not they're in person is in flux. Um, their numbers are sort of going up, so it all depends on their venue, which is the Microsoft Center in Times Square. So um, week by week, they're keeping up with that. And I feel really bad that Drupal Camp Chattanooga is not on this list because Lee is here. Um, I don't have those dates in front of me, so I'm not sure when that is happening. Do you want to share that, Lee? Yeah, he says, looking it up quick. <laughs> <laughs> it is, I think it's the first week of November. Uh, really? Did our site go down? I've got the world's longest URL. Um, uh, November the 7th is what we're talking right now. And we're, we're thinking, we're hoping we can do in person. Um, but we're keeping an eye on the second wave uh, and it's looking like now it probably will have to be virtual. So, because I was kind of hoping it would be done and we could also go to Barcelona in, in December, right? Right. Okay, so, um, and then Drupal Camp Florida or Florida Drupal Camp is February 19th and 21st and they are planning an in-person event um, so far, but again, those spikes in numbers might change all of that. Um, Drupal Jobs, um, if you wanna know who's hiring, you can go to jobs.drupal.org. Um, the community working group um, came out with an article a few weeks ago on loss of work resources. And I know that various Drupal camps have job postings on their board. Bad Camp has several companies with several jobs each listed on the job board if you want to check that out. Um, and then starting next week, New York City Camp will have their job board open too. So check out various Drupal camps for job boards. And then after, um, after the two sessions and presentations today, we can talk and network and see who's looking and who's um, hiring. And what is coming up for SF Doug? Uh, next meetup is July 9th, and our very own Alyssa Thomas of Oomph will be talking about the voting API and customizing contests. Um, contests, it's a deep dive technical talk covering a case study for a client who needed to launch a web contest with online voting. Um, she'll talk about the voting API um, module um, and how it provided the framework. Um, but uh, how she also had to customize um, to fulfill other requirements on the project. And then um, going with the flow of having SF Doug every two weeks, um, Danny Englander from Canopy will be talking about getting started with Layout Builder for Drupal 8 on July 23rd. And that's another early session that starts at 3.30 and lasts till 5.30. And he'll cover the basics of getting started with Layout Builder. Um, he covers how to get up and running and the basics of setting up a content type using Layout Builder. And then he's also going to um, delve into the Layout Builder styles module and how it can really help with theming a Layout Builder page and how um, to do an override and how custom configuration works with all of it. Um, and then if you do want to talk and have some valuable things for us to share or something fun, I'm always up for new speakers. Um, so just reach out to me and um, I can get you on the list to speak at SF Doug. Um, we talk a lot about Bad Camp because we are based in San Francisco. Um, we are looking for volunteers. Um, going virtual opens up a lot of space um, for volunteers with room monitors and that kind of thing. So help make Bad Camp more precious. Um, reach out to Valerie at Rooted for more information. And then thank you Canopy Studios for organizing um, SF Doug and providing the Zoom room for two nights meetup. And with that, we're at the top of the hour, so I'm going to hand it over to Jeff. Great, thanks. A lot of exciting stuff there. All right, can you see the screen? Yep. Great. 
So as Amy said, we're going to talk about uh, using Lando to uh, do Drupal contributions and to, to facilitate and make that um, easy. I'm Jeff St. Pierre. I'm a senior engineer at Tandem. And that's some stuff I do, but basically I like to make stuff at the end of the day. That's what it comes down to for me. So Lando, her uh, plus Drupal source code and some tooling is going to glue the things together to make uh, providing Drupal contributions maybe a little bit easier than if you're doing it uh, manually or, or the old fashioned way. So Lando is going to provide ephemeral dev environments that, uh, as Amy said earlier, we can spin them up, tear them down, get rid of them um, so that we don't have to worry too much and we can start with clean states whenever we need to. So I've added a little bit of glue into this um, into this Lando Drupal 8 recipe, and I've got Lando Rebuild hooking into some events that's going to pull down the Drupal source code for us and uh, have our contribution environment ready to go. <clears throat> I've added a tooling command called patch. So when you do Lando patch, you can uh, pull down uh, a um, Drupal patch and apply it to your Drupal instance so that you can test that patch. Lando revert will undo the patch. Uh, if you are creating a patch, um, if you're fixing an issue on Drupal.org, you can uh, use Lando create patch to um, automatically create the patch based on the diff of you know, the commits on your branch versus what's on the um, 8.8.x branch. Lando test just runs the uh, simple tests from, from Drupal. So if you've written a test for your patch and you want to run that, you can use this Lando test command. So that's another tooling command that's added into this, into this uh, Lando plus Drupal for contributions. And Lando destroy will tear it all down so that you can uh, start fresh. So the uh, GitHub repo that I'm using is thinktandem slash Drupal dash contributions. So that's all the source code if you want to utilize this method of testing and or creating patches for Drupal issues. And I've written a blog post <clears throat> that is probably going to be a little bit more detailed than, than time allows for in this presentation. So if you want to refer to that, you can if you want to. <clears throat> That's actually not published yet because I wrote it for this. So I wanted to present to you guys first, uh, give you guys the opportunity, and then um, and then that'll be published shortly. And then you can we can refer back to that if we need to. It's got all the all the commands we're going to talk about, and probably more than we'll talk about today that you can copy and paste and use and see how to use this. Okay, so um, what I've got here is just a. a a clone of that that repo that I that I was showing you there, the, the GitHub repo, and what it's got in here is some helper scripts and a Lando file so that we can um, spin up a contribution environment. So what I'm going to do is a Lando rebuild. So typically, when you're first starting a Lando app, you're just going to start it. But I've added two uh, event hooks in here to pull down the Drupal source code when we rebuild. And it's going to run Composer for us. It's going to install Drupal. So everything will be uh, ready to go to make our uh, contributions. So you can see it's cloning uh, the Drupal source code now. Here's the blog post that talks about the why of this project and the how and the stuff I'm talking about right now. So I'm just basically going to go through this blog post with you guys right now. So I'm doing the Lando rebuild, which is um, pulling in the Drupal source code, uh, do the install. Here's the GitHub repo, sync tandem slash Drupal dash contributions. So you can <clears throat> grab that if you want to uh, utilize this method to get started. Um, the thing that you're going to have to do, um, besides have your development environment, which is Lando is spinning up for us now, is visit the Drupal issue queue and find an issue. So if you are wanting to test an issue, you would look for an issue that's in uh, needs review, and then you can um, 
test that issue. So I've gone through and found a, a needs review issue. So this is uh, 296 and a user here wants to be able to uh, open up uh, file fields, the links um, in, a, in a new window. It wants to be able to have the option to have that in a new tab. So there's an issue here and you can see people have been chatting about it and working on it. And there's a uh, patch provided. So that's what we're gonna test. So I'm gonna um, copy that URL. You can open it if you want and just copy the URL. So that's the patch that somebody wrote for this issue. So you can see this is uh, started up. And after I did the, it did the composer install, pulled down Drupal, installed the site, enabled simple test, things like that. And I had it spit out a ULI link so I can um, get to the site. So that's our uh, Drupal 8 site install from, from source code. So let's take a look at this patch. So I'm gonna grab this URL. And if you just run Lando, you can see the commands that are available to you. And these are the normal uh, Lando commands that, that we're used to. Um, but I've added in this Lando patch command so we can get a patch from a project and apply it. So that's the one I'm going to use right now. I'm going to do Lando patch. And I'm going to paste in that uh, patch URL. And then when you run that, it goes out and gets the patch and applies it to your uh, to your Drupal site. And if you want to uh, get rid of that, you can do uh, revert and undo the patch. So at the current moment, you see that the patch has modified some of these core files here. So let's try Lando revert. Oh, I got to give it the patch name. Oh, that didn't work. So we can file bugs as we're going here. Oh, I got a bracket in there. There we go. So we got rid of the, um, by Lando Revert undid the changes to that core directory that this, that this patch was doing. But in this case, um, so let's look at the issue. And they want to um, open these file fields in a new window. So what I'm going to do is go to structure, content types, and it uh, doesn't matter what content type you're on, but we're going to add a file field. And then if we add a piece of content, which one did I do? Basic page. I need a text file. So I'm going to make a text file. that text file to the node, save it, and if I click on it, it opens in the same window. So to test this patch, 
we want to apply the patch. So that's applied. Refresh this page. Oh, that's still opened in the same window. Did I really apply it? It looks like it's applied. Maybe that's a clear cache. Oh, still opening in the same window. Can I apply the right patch? Looks right. Looks like the right patch. Oh, <laughs> I applied the patch, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't utilize the functionality that the patch, the patch provides. So what we want to do is um, on the content type here, manage display, on the file field that we made, we want to configure this. And it provides this new open file in a new tab. So when that's not checked, the, the behavior is the same as it always was. So what you were seeing there, me fiddling around trying to get it to open in a new window is the correct behavior. I was just not doing it correctly. So let's see what happens if we refresh this page. There we go. So it's not going to do everything for you. you st even though the new functionality was applied, you have to use it. <laughs> All right. So at that point, you can, um, you can, uh, you know, kick the tires more, apply it, unapply it, do what you want. But we could uh, now go here and comment on the issue and say that we uh, <clears throat> we pulled this down, we kicked the tires, tell, give a list of what we did, how we tested, um, and that it works. And you don't check the box, and we check the box, those kinds of things. And then we can mark this as uh, reviewed and tested so that a maintainer can come along and see if they agree with us or not, and if either request more changes or additional changes or, uh, or uh, commit the patch to, to Drupal core. So at this point, we can uh, revert this patch and work on something new. We can destroy the app and just get rid of it all together. Um, we can run some, run the tests. So one of the commands that's provided in this, in this recipe of Lindo plus Drupal core contributions is the test command. And uh, we can use those to run, run the simple tests. So if we do Lando, uh, help, Lando test minus minus help, we get the uh, output of the test help from the test command that uh, Drupal core provides. And we're, what we're doing is just adding it to Lando tooling so that we can use it. So one thing that we can do in here is apply, uh, we can run a, we can run a test of a whole module of all of Drupal core tests or of, of a specific file. So the test that this module provides is here. So we can run that. And that fires up simple test and runs the test for us. And we can see if everything is uh, working as expected. So the test is passing as well. So that's great. That just gives us more confidence of uh, what, what we can comment on in this issue. If we investigate the Lando file, 
So I'm just using a Drupal 8 recipe that I've put some extra glue around to work with these patches to apply them and revert them and uh, get a nice environment up. So we've got Drush, um, we've got the SI command. So if we do Lando SI, we can install the site really quickly. That's happening automatically when we do a rebuild. So all that stuff happened when we first spun up this environment. And then I've added the patch tooling, the revert tooling, um, so you can see uh, in the create patch tooling and the test command that we were just looking at. And these events are what I'm hooking into Lando events in order to get Drupal installed from the source code uh, so that we can apply these patches. So that's how you can uh, test a patch. So um, are there any questions about any of that? Um, is simple, I thought for some reason simple test was being deprecated. Is that not right? Uh, I saw some conversation in Drupal 9 where people were saying just run the tests directly via PHP unit. I haven't worked too much with Drupal 9, so that might be where the deprecation is coming in. But for Drupal 8, you can still use simple test, which runs the, you can use it to run the functional tests and, um, and the unit tests <clears throat> like, like we just did. Uh, but that might, that might be where the Drupal the application is coming in and is in Drupal 9. Yeah, yeah, I've been just super focused on 9 stuff. Sure, sure. So if you want to uh, apply a patch, um, you um, just open up whatever issue you're working on, open up the source code, and you would get your file just like you normally would. And then you would change some code in here. And once you have the code changed, uh, you would check out your branch. So you're, you're not on the 8.8.x branch, check out your own branch, uh, commit the ch apply, do your changes, test them locally like you normally would, and then just commit that change. And once you have it committed to your branch, then you can just do Lando create patch. And it will create the patch file from the diff of the branch that you're on versus the 8.8.x branch. And if you want to you know, change that branch to Drupal 9 or whatever you can, it would be nice to make this tool uh, uh, like either ask you or allow you to choose Drupal 9 when you're, when you're starting it up or something like that. Uh, I didn't have time to do anything fancy like that, but it would could be a good uh, good feature for this. Mark posted a question in chat. Um, he asked, "Is there any example Lando config for doing Drupal's browser and JavaScript tests that require Chrome driver?" Uh, I think I I quickly was on the test page and doing the Lando test. I was on the the page that had a uh, had a JavaScript test and I ran it and it ran and I was I wanted to do a deep dive into that but I didn't get a chance when I was building this up so the jury's out although following the instructions on that page I did have some success but I wasn't exactly sure that it was really uh, spinning up the Chrome driver so more investigation is required there but I I'm confident that we could get that to work with some some investigation. So if that's something that's uh, meaningful to you, you could either start up an issue in that uh, think tandem slash Drupal dash contributions issue queue, or just hit us up on Slack, get in, get in touch with us somehow so we can uh, collaborate on that and figure out how to make that happen. So now when you're <clears throat> done with everything, we can uh, do a Lando uh, destroy. And I've added in some uh, event responders um, to uh, get rid of the source code so that, so that it really destroys, really is ephemeral. So now we're back to our start state without any Drupal. And if we do, then, then we could just reiterate, we could do a Lando rebuild. If you, don't want to totally destroy, you can of course, you know, just check back out to the 
that X branch and uh, start a new patch procedure from there. Um, that should work just fine. But if you want to make really sure that you're not, you don't have any clutter around, you can do the land or destroy and start your whole process over again. So that's what I've got. Um, you can check out the repo and see the kind of glue that is in this uh, scripts directory that uh, just the little helper strips that make it happen. But you don't have to care about that if you don't want to. You can just do Lando patch and have the stuff happen and do your testing. That's what I've got for you folks. If you have any questions, I'm glad to answer them. Otherwise, that's what I had to say. Very cool. Thanks. Yep. You're welcome. There's a there's a chat message question. I don't know if you answered that already. Yeah. Oh, uh, that that was the Chrome driver one. Yep. Yep. Uh, we need uh, some research on that. You can probably use Blue Hat for those kind of tests. You can. There you is can, a way to integrate Lando and Blue Hat. So yeah. Yep. You can integrate Lando and Blue Hat. Um, I'm not sure that Drupal Core leverages BHAT testing, but if you're writing your own tests against your own Drupal app, uh, people have certainly used Lando and BHAT together. And there's uh, some blog posts and uh, some information in the Lando issue queue about how to get that stuff fired up. I have a um, question. Um, I've been using um, Lando to do contributions, and I just spin up a regular Drupal site, not with that uh, link that you had provided at the beginning. And I find it really difficult to have two running instances at once. Um, there's no real good solution to that because they, um, if I try a second instance, it will tell me my site's already installed. Um, does your recipe take care of that? Or am I still <clears throat> be able to run one at a time? Uh, so you have two different Lando apps? Right, so I'm yeah. I think uh, the only thing that you have to do there is make sure that they're not, they don't have the same name. If they have the same name, they're gonna collide when they try to make the, um, the, the shared volumes. Um, so if you're trying to run two different instances, make sure like one's called Drupal Contributions and the other one's called Drupal Contributions 2 or something different. Okay. And then that should be, that should be fine. Okay. Um, I have a question. First, mm -hmm. thank you so much for this presentation. Really awesome. I've been kind of, i had been using Docker and then Lando, but really not in a coherent way. And just even the, the create patch is, is really cool. Um, I've just been suffering through this week. For some reason, I host whatever my setup was, and I'm getting this dreaded, like, uh, bootstrap cannot execute command from this directory or something. Um, it's a pretty specific question, but I don't know. Sometimes I, I get that issue where I can't use Drush with Lando. Like it won't, I, I'll be able to run like Lando Drush status, but I can't do like Lando Drush up DB or something higher hmm. level. Um, one thing like Lando doesn't change the way Drush works. So a lot of people like if you're using a nested web route, like this thing is putting the Drupal code inside web. So the project route is here and then the Drupal route is in a different place. So if you're not in the web route, it's not gonna understand how to, how to bootstrap Drupal and do the things. Um, what I usually do is put this line in here. Um, so under my tooling, you don't need this to use Drush, but I like to do it so that I don't have to actually change into the web route. So I passing in as the command I'm telling it that the web root is in slash app slash web or whatever your web root is. And then I just make it aware of the Drupal URL. So if I do like uh, Drush ULI, it gives me the proper URL and not just the ending part of it. So I'm not sure if that could mm. help alleviate some of your issues. Yeah, um, you know, I think I did actually get that to, to help work. Yeah, I think I'm just having, I think just some weird Drush issues. But no, that's yeah. super cool. Yeah, I will definitely look at this repo. Thanks There's for, all... well, I also wanted you to point that out to other people because that line is really a key. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like that line. If you're not using that line, 
to use Drush, what you want to do is CD into that web directory and then do your Lando Drush things, uh, which is also perfectly fine. Cool, thanks. You're welcome. I see Alec on the call. Um, I had asked earlier about the new release of Lando. Do you want to speak to that a little bit, Alec? Unfortunately, I think my uh, my son probably wants to speak about it. <laughs> I'm joining with a, a young baby, so he might be a little loud. Um, but yeah, it, for, I guess if he's being quiet right now, anyone that's interested, we're going to be holding actually a, um, a little release party that'll be a tour through the new stable version of Lando. Um, on July 10th, that's Friday after next, I believe. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, sign up for that. I'll put a link into the, uh, the Zoom chat here. Cool, thanks. Does anybody else have any questions? Oh, okay. Um, are you ready, Gabe? Do you want to start your conversation? Always ready. Cool. Take it away. Okay. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Gabe. I'm an attorney. Oh, but I'm sh sharing your screen and I can still see myself really big. Somebody whose screen is sharing? That's Jeff's screen. You want to stop sharing your screen, Jeff? There we go. I learned that the key to Zoom is to not look at yourself. Um, so yeah, I'm an attorney at Matchstick Legal. I know a few of you on the call. I've worked with a few of you on the call. Um, and uh, a couple people were nice enough to suggest um, that I might have some useful content to share with you folks. Um, I've talked about a lot of things, mainly contracts. Um, and I thought, particularly right now, people actually seem to be spinning up new businesses. Um, that's, we're seeing a lot of that. New partnerships are forming, some are breaking apart, but there's a lot of movement in that arena. Um, hopefully this isn't uh, low hanging fruit too much for, for you folks. And some of you seem to have some experience in business um, and I can provide some value here. Um, but for anybody who hasn't had to deal with formation of entities, entity choice, um, taxation issues around that, um, this should be this should be useful uh, and what I'm going to do is give sort of a high level overview of what the differences are between these entity choices or at least the three or four different types of entities that um, you guys might choose from to start your new business um, or convert your business perhaps so we start with sort of the plain Jane sole proprietorship which is um, just you, an individual running your business, uh, whether it's under your name or a fictitious business name. Um, you know, Gabe Levine can do business as um, Joe's Taco Shack. Um, Gabe Levine's sole proprietorship doing business as Joe's Taco Shack. Um, Gabe Levine shouldn't do that though, uh, in, in Gabe Levine's own opinion, because um, there's no liability limit on, no, no protection for my personal assets. My bank accounts, my house, um, all of those are to some extent um, exposed in that if there's a judgment against my company, uh, my little business, somebody can come along and um, put uh, liens on those assets and try to take them. Um, so for this reason, I want to form either a corporation or an LLC to create that liability shield, um, that corporate veil that protects my bank accounts in my house um, from people suing me for, for most things that they can sue me for. Um, there are some exceptions, but I don't want to get into them. It's beyond the scope and would take too much time. And, and I'm going to try to end um, a few minutes early, but... I'm gonna keep an eye out and everyone else keep an eye out. If somebody raises their hand during, I'm more than happy to answer a question. Sometimes it's more helpful in context. So just shoot your hand up and um, I'll answer it while I'm chatting. All right, so if 
if we don't want to be a sole prop, and, oh, and by the way, if there's more than one of you in the business, you can just be a general partnership. So, um, you know, Gabe and Amy are operating uh, Gabe and Amy's Taco Shack. Um, and we have a general partnership and we have a partnership agreement. And now we're both fully exposed for the debts and obligations of that business. Um, so still not a great idea. Um, well, we've decided to form either an LLC or corporation. So in that scenario, our, our goal is to operate this restaurant for a long period of time and make some money. Um, maybe we eventually sell it, but the main goal is to generate revenue and have that be a profitable business over time. Um, with that sort of situation, my general preference is for LLCs because they are very flexible and they require less administration to maintain. Um, there really aren't any downsides um, that I can easily identify to an LLC. Um, LLCs allow you to elect to be taxed as um, a C Corp, although that's quite rare, or as an S Corp. So if you want the benefits of S Corp taxation, you can still get that within the confines of your LLC entity. Um, so why might I choose an S Corp instead? Um, and again, I could choose that S Corp as an LLC, or I could actually form a corporation and then choose to make it an S Corp. I think the reasons to choose S Corp are largely driven by tax considerations. Um, and what I mean by that is once you reach a certain level of profitability, your CPA can move things into certain buckets, create certain benefit plans for your company that can end up saving a not insignificant amount of money. And you can't do that as easily under partnership accounting rules, which is the de default for LLCs. Um, so in the beginning, a lot of people choose LLCs, knowing that if they reach the point where it becomes beneficial to uh, choose S Corp accounting, they can do that. It is much harder to go the other direction. Um, if you form a corp or one, you know, or once you elect into S Corp accounting rules, it is much harder to go the other direction back to an LLC because there are, there is a distribution of assets to the owners that becomes potentially tax, taxable. Um, so again, a lot of people start with LLCs. So why might I choose to go with a corporation out of the gate. Um, if you are thinking about starting up a product company or some other type of company that isn't intended to be immediately or even in the near term profitable, but you are starting it to potentially receive investment and sell it, um, being a C-Corp is uh, probably a good idea. Uh, for a number of reasons, including that investors and potential acquirers are comfortable with the C Corp construct and they know what they're getting with the C Corp. The rules around stockholder rights are particularly well defined. And they're even more well defined if that corporation is a Delaware corporation, because Delaware has, was the first state to form corps and create them. And uh, export them to other states, and they have a whole court, the Chancery Court, just dedicated to corporations. So um, people are very comfortable with that, uh, venture capitalists, even angel investors. Um, the C Corp provides another potential benefit that a lot of people don't really know about um, unless they're reading books on starting up companies. And that benefit is the qualified small business uh, um, tax relief if you will. Um, and what it does is, uh, under certain circumstances, you form a C-Corp, uh, you don't make the S election, um, certain size of that company and other things that, that make it qualify. If and when you do sell that company and it's a stock sale, there can be up to $10 million, which you know, is a very good win for most people, um, and probably everybody here, including me, um, to be tax-free uh, for federal 
cap gains tax. So you just take 10 million bucks off the table minus the state tax. Um, so if you're, if that's your long-term goal and you're not looking at near-term profitability or at least near-term profitability, that's going to be sucked out by owners, meaning everything is left in the corp and you don't have to worry about that double taxation hit that C corps have, then a C corp is a very good idea. Some other considerations. Um, do you have multiple people? Do you have multiple owners? Um, is, it's, it's easier to move things around with multiple owners within an LLC than it is um, in a corporation, uh, whether it is a C Corp or an S Corp, because the rules around stock, both from a tax and security standpoint, are a little tighter uh, than they are around membership interests in LLCs, a little more rigorous. Um, so if you have multiple owners, particularly in a service based situation, again, that sort of pushes you towards an LLC. Um, with an LLC, you have, instead of all your corporate documents, your bylaws and your minutes, meeting minutes and all that jazz, that you, it's an ongoing obligation. You have your operating agreement, which is sort of a combination of your partnership agreement and your bylaws. So this is how the company runs, and this is you know, what happens if one of us dies or decides we wanna leave. And this is how we're gonna make distributions of money and that sort of thing. Um, so compensation is another factor to consider. How do you want to and how do you expect to compensate yourselves as owners? Um, with an LLC that doesn't elect to be taxed as an S Corp or Corp, uh, you just have partnership distributions from a tax perspective. Um, there is a way to do what is called a guaranteed payment, which is like a salary. It's money that is paid to you by the LLC, by the business for your services, and it has slightly different tax implications. But that and any uh, distributions that the business uh, management decides to make um, are all you know, your money. Um, from a tax standpoint, the allocations are typically made uh, to it's all flow through tax. There's no tax at the LLC level. So the allocations are made to the owners. So let's say you have a 50-50 partnership, Gabe and Amy each own 50% of that LLC. Um, that LLC has $100,000 of profit in 2020. We each get $50,000 of income uh, on our taxes for that, um, irrespective of how much we take out in distribution, distributions, irrespective of what our guaranteed payments are. Um, so that is, that is how that works. Um, if uh, you decide to go with a corporation or you elect corporation tax treatment within an LLC, you have to pay yourselves a reasonable salary. What that means is open for discussion, um, but the IRS basically wants to get its employment taxes. So, and the state taxing authorities want their employment taxes. So they will you know, look at if you're ever audited, what the company is bringing in um, and what is reasonable to pay someone doing the type of work you are for that type of company. This is kind of problematic for a lot of startups that don't have money in the bank to start paying themselves right away. So another reason that folks opt for LLC uh, status. Um, technically, you as a service provider, as an employee of a corporation could sue your own corporation. Um, for unpaid wages. I have seen it done. <laughs> um, I represented a corporation where the CEO had sold the corporation on kind of an as is basis, had sold the stock to someone else. And that CEO, then one of his workers is who he sold it to. Um, that CEO then made claims for back pay that were unpaid wages. So it, it can happen, it's unlikely, but it can happen. That's one of the complications to having a corporation. You have to pay yourself a salary. Let's see, other factors. Um, we talked a little bit about conversions, um, but, and I'm realizing this is gonna go a lot faster. It's weird without slides and without feedback. Everything goes very fast. Um, corporations can give stock options. Corporations can give things like RSUs and incentive stock. Those are typically reserved for larger companies, public companies. So really we're talking about stock options 
for product company startups. And that is most typical with a C Corp. It's quite rare that you're gonna see an S Corp giving out stock options. So you have a product company, it's a C Corp, it's not profitable, but you're taking an investment, so you have money to pay everybody. Um, and you set up a stock option pool to be able to give stock options to your employees and other service providers. Um, LLCs provide more flexibility, um, assuming you haven't made that as selection. You can give membership interests, um, grant membership interest or sell membership interests. If you make straight grants of a membership interest, um, the people receiving it have income equal to the fair market value of that membership interest. So if it's very early in the life of the LLC, um, it probably is not worth a lot and there is not that much to worry about, but it still creates this sort of tax headache that you are giving something to someone that, that is income. If that someone is an employee of the LLC, you know, then there are withholding obligations for the company and employment taxes as well. So there's obligations on the tax side for both the company and the employee. There's something very unique to LLCs and partnerships um, that allow you to give a membership interest in a going concern LLC that has value. It's been around for a few years. Maybe it's worth one or two million bucks. You're doing well. Um, you can create something called a profits interest. And again, this is as long as there's no S election because S elections prohibit different types of economic interests in the equity in the company. Just one class of stock is allowed. So the profits interest is a cool tool for LLCs that says, I'm going to go ahead and give you employee number one, um, equity in my company that's equal to 5% of the company. Um, I'm going to give you, you know, 500 out of the 10,000 units of membership interest we have. Um, normally that would be taxable. So a company is worth a million dollars. So you'd be getting $50,000 of income, but it's not because we've created a profits interest. The only difference between our equity and yours is that if the company sells, if there's a final liquidating distribution, we're winding up the company, that million bucks is gonna come off the top to us first. Us current owners, Amy and Gabe, are getting that million bucks. But let's just say that it's a $10 million sale. Now you're gonna go ahead and get 5% of that 9 million. In this way, the IRS has sort of created the fiction or the Congress has created the fiction that this thing that you're getting, this asset, um, this, this membership interest is worth nothing on day one when you get it. So there's nothing, there's no income, nothing to tax. So those, those are the tools in general that people use for equity incentives within um, corporations and S-corps um, and LLCs. There's, there's a there, question. There's a question in the chat. Um, okay. What is the best approach for freelancers and their work relationships to other businesses as an LLC versus sole proprietorship? Are sole props more risky as being viewed as an employee versus a business to business relationship? Okay, let's see. So Amy says, what's the best approach for freelancers? Okay. Um, yes. So that's a great question. Corporations are better. You know, which box am I going to go into when I try to, you know, do some, some work for, for Dell? Uh, Dell wants to put up a new, you know, site for this product and they've hired me to, to, to do this site for them. Um, and, you know, they want, they want to make me an employee and make me run through some manpower affiliate because particularly in California, you know, we have this, this, you know, new AB five law that makes it very difficult to hire freelancers and independent contractors. If you have a corporation, um, that is paying, you're paying yourself a salary. You've got insurance, um, things like that it can get you into a different bucket in that large public company's sort of risk profile. Um, my personal experience is that, which isn't insignificant in this regard, is that LLCs that are one or even two 
member LLCs with no other employees, harder to get in that bucket than corporations. So for that reason, Amy, corps tend to be a little bit better. And certainly um, having a little bit better than LLCs and definitely better than sole proper partnership. Um, and certainly having a uh, corporation is, is much better than, than that sole prop in general. Does that answer it? Thumbs up, Amy? Okay. So one of the other things that people consider when they're, the lack of feedback's hard for me. <laughs> I'm used to somebody going, yeah, I get it. Um, so some of the considerations that other people consider are just the administrative burden. <laughs> just the administrative burden associated with maintaining your company. So sole props are real easy. You have to do a fictitious business name filing if you're operating under a fictitious business name, and that's about it. Um, you can, but you do not have to even get a separate EIN tax ID for that company. Um, LLCs and corporations require some level of filings and ongoing administration. LLCs only require very limited, and I'm speaking about California here, but this is true across most states. There's a filing once every two years. After your initial formation documents, there's a filing once every two years that you make as an informational filing that you send to the California Secretary, Secretary of State. Very easy. Um, again, similar in other states. New York has some real weird rules around LLCs, however, and publication when you form them. Don't worry about it. Um, corporations, on the other hand, in addition to that same filing, slightly different form for corps, that you also have to make it annually instead of biannually for a corporation versus a LLC, requires annual meetings. So these are your corporate formalities that you need to observe in order to not put the corporate veil at risk. So if somebody comes along to sue your corporation for a lot of money, um, they may try, particularly if you have not observed these corporate formalities, or you don't have adequate funding in your company, adequate insurance to protect against these liabilities, try to pierce the corporate veil. And they may also may allege that you treat it as an alter ego, you take money out of the bank account for your own lunch, your own car payment, et cetera. Um, get a good CPA, talk to them about that stuff, have them set it up. So you have your meeting minutes annually. What does this mean, particularly if you're the sole shareholder, director, and officer? Well, it doesn't mean much, except that you have to put down this stuff on a piece of paper annually. You can get as detailed about it or not as you want. Some people, you know, just going to do directors meetings once annually and have it say, you know, nothing's changed. We approve all the actions of the officers. Shareholder meeting, nothing's changed. We approve all the actions of the directors and we reelect the same directors, i.e. I reelect myself as the board of directors. Um, some people really want to button up their corporate housekeeping. They're worried about liability exposure. They have the directors approve all the important transactions that the officers made on behalf of the corporation. Opening a bank account that year, you know, getting a new line of credit, hiring three people, um, firing one person, entering into a lease, that sort of stuff. That's a burden, an administrative burden that you have with the corporation that you don't have with an LLC. And you know, that honestly is about it for high level considerations. Um, I can take us down a couple of rabbit holes for deeper considerations, but I think I'd rather open it up to questions and see if you guys have some. Um, and if not, I can talk at you for a few more minutes. Austin asks, are all the protections for an LLC the same for a nonprofit? I believe so. I'm not a nonprofit expert, but um, I, whether you're a nonprofit corporation, a corporation, or an LLC, um, as long as you're not, you know, commingling and losing the corporate veil for the nonprofit, you have all of, if not more, protections from personal liability. And there are, I should say, there are other forms of entities. You know, I haven't gone into B Corps and stuff like that. I'm not, again, an expert in those, but they're interesting and useful if you have a particular need um, or a particular interest. Um, somebody just asked, what's your familiarity with the Benefit Corp or Certified B Corps? Not enough, so I'm not gonna speak on it. 
um, and it and it varies, um, you know, state to state. Um, but it's worth it's worth looking into um, if you have a corporation that you want to have focused on serving only nonprofit clients, for example, or something like that. It's it's something worth looking into. There's also uh, limited partnerships. That's a very strange vehicle, um, and it's used mostly within investment, you know, investment type type companies and real estates, uh, real estate companies because of its its oddities. And I've never seen an ongoing business that that uses it other than one that got stuck with it and then had to put two layers above it. So I don't think it's really worth talking about. Um, but that does that limited partnership option exists as well. And what that what that does is it has one general partner that's liable, and then the limited partners, typically investors who are not liable. Um, and oftentimes that general partner is also a corporation. So there's really liability protection for everybody within that GP or that limited partnership. Other questions? Anybody? All right, Amy. Well, I think I think that's what I've got. Um, okay, that's cool. Thanks. That's cool. <laughs> Do you want to go down a rabbit hole? Well, sure. Um, okay, I'll I'll show. I was going to show you guys. I don't know California. Are there, Amy? Are there a lot of people not in California that might be starting businesses out of the state on the call? There's a, I don't know if they're starting businesses. There are a handful of people outside of California on the call, but there's a good number of people here in California on the call. So. Okay. Yeah. Hold on one second and I'll share my screen. Uh, I, for one, am a big fan of other people paying me. So I let them do it. Other people paying you? Exactly. Instead of me having to pay myself. Haha. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting when, you know, your company for me kind of grows into a company and then the company's paying you and it's other, other people's efforts are contributing to that. It feels both good and bad. Um, I'm learning. So I, I wanted to show you guys, California has upped its game significantly. One of the reasons that people choose Delaware and lawyers like Delaware is because everything can be done so easily online. Um, but if you want to form, a, maybe a couple of years ago, they started allowing you to form LLCs um, on the California um, Secretary of State website, and you can now form corporations as well, um, which is really cool. I, I don't suggest you go out there doing it. Um, I would at least use um, something like a legal zoom or uh, incorporate.com. And I would only do that. You know, if you have a very good CPA and you are a sole owner operator, never go into one of these, you know, business deals with someone, even if you love them and trust them, um, without really thinking about your partnership deal, your, whether it's an operating agreement, partnership agreement, or a stockholder shareholder agreement. Too many people overlook that and four, five, six, seven, ten 10 years down the line, there's the inevitable business breakup, whether it's for good reasons or bad, um, and you didn't think about it. So I think LegalZoom and Incorporate.com, again, as long as you have a good CPA, <clears throat> are pretty darn good for a sole member LLC or a sole shareholder corporation. But if there's more than one of you, really, really suggest going to a lawyer, thinking it through. Um, but California's website really does make this easy, easy now. And another thing you can do it, that you didn't, you weren't um, able to do previously is to reserve names. Um, so you can send in name reservation requests, which you didn't used to be able to do in California. You could always do it in Delaware. That's kind of neat. You know, you get a name, it locks for 90 days while you're thinking about your branding. Um, there's other stuff you can do on the USPTO, but again, that's outside the scope. Um, you can also do a little diligence yourself and just search for, you know, Gabe's Taco Shack. Oh, good. I could open my Taco Shack, my live stream. Um, and nobody has it in California. Let's see. Other 
rabbit hole items I was maybe going to pester you with. Give me a second. You know, there's always a way the cost benefit analysis, analysis of confusing people. Um, I, I do think that's it, Amy. So if there's no questions, we'll call it a we'll call it a presentation. Okay, great. Thank you, Gabe. You're welcome. So I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>